<laughs> I'm Rich Keevy. I'm the director of the Policy Research Institute here at Princeton University. And I welcome you to the campus on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson School for our discussion on a view from the top, a conversation with former governors. Oh, good morning. Good morning. I thought I was going to say we only have two, but we have three. Thank goodness. They multiply. Well, who knows? <laughs> An institute dedicated to public policy research aims to present forms that generate interest among a cross-section of scholars and practitioners, attract high-caliber speakers, and address topics of significant breadth and resonance. At best, these sessions also hold the potential to influence the consideration and course of timely issues. I think this morning's gathering more than meets that criteria. In the same vein, only a matter of such weight and importance could draw the speakers that we have today. In Brendan Byrne, Jim Florio, and Donald DeFrancesco, we have not only three former governors, but three leaders who dealt with the challenge at the highest possible level. From as early as Robinson versus Cahill decision in the 1970s, through the ongoing Abbott Burke reforms, in recent years. I wish to thank each of the governors personally for their participation. It is an honor and a privilege to have them share their insights with us today. While the governors serve as the centerpiece of our program, we will also benefit from the guidance of our moderator, Dick Leung, the former New Jersey State Treasurer, and presently the president of the Century Foundation, as well as Gordon McGinnis, senior education policy expert here at the Woodrow Wilson School, and of course a former assemblyman and senator and an assistant commissioner for education. Those of you who have followed education policy over the past decades know that Dick and Gordon have some of the most thoughtful perspectives as anyone on this issue. A line contained in the Supreme Court opinion accompanying the 1990 Abbott Burke decision is very instructive. The justices wrote, the dilemma is that while we spend so much time, there is absolutely no, much, no question that we are failing to provide the students in the poorer districts with the kind of an education that anyone could call thorough and efficient. As a matter of fact, of course, the debate on Abbott Burke continues to this very day, as reflected in Governor Corzine's recently proposed school funding plan. Based on the data just released by the governor, he intends to maintain a foundation formula. The local fair share will continue to be based on property values and income, as well as the concentration of needy students, especially where they live. How Governor Corzine's plan evolves will write the next chapter, next chapter of Abbott Burke. In closing, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our co-sponsors from the Public Education Institute at the Center for Effective Practices at Rutgers University. In particular, I want to acknowledge and introduce Herb Green. Herb is the director of the Public Education Institute and one of the most tireless education advocates in New Jersey. And without Herb's vision, commitment, this morning's event probably would not have come to fruition. So without further ado, let me turn to Herb for a few comments, and then he'll turn it over to our moderator, uh, Dick Leone. Herb, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm never sure I'm going to make it, you know, with the, <laughs> as the days dwindle down to oppressors few. But I am delighted, and I think this timely event uh, uh, will uh, inform all of us and get us thinking more seriously than we have, perhaps, about uh, the, uh, the issues at hand. I want to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Public Education Institute at Rutgers, on behalf of my colleague, Claudia uh, Barzakelli, who is the co-director and my driver, 
and Isabel <laughs> Gonzalez, and, uh, and we're getting a new car tomorrow, Claudia <laughs> tells me. Uh, I, uh, I just, a, just a couple of things that, that come to mind. Uh, one is that uh, I remember uh, the 1977 gubernatorial campaign when uh, Governor Byrne had half the state of New Jersey running against him in the primary. And, uh, but he, he got there and then I heard him in a debate at the New Jersey School Boards Association convention in October in which he debated his opponent in the election. And uh, I was so stirred by that. I remember as a young boy then uh, <laughs> running up to him and shaking his hand and telling him how much that speech meant to me. And obviously it meant a great deal, uh, similar speeches meant a great deal during the election. This, uh, despite the fact that the income tax was a big issue, uh, if you remember in 1977. And, and then, of course, there is Governor Florio, uh, whom I've admired tremendously uh, from, uh, well, long before he took uh, the position of governor. And uh, I reminded him this morning of a, a speech of his that I ran across. It was an, ex and I, I've had it in my, in my file for a long time. It was his acceptance speech uh, at the, uh, where the trustees of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation uh, gave him an award. And his speech really um, uh, describes everything that Jim Florio has meant, I think, to the state and, and to the citizens in it. I, he, um, uh, I can't read the whole thing, although I offered it to him, and he said he'd give me his time uh, if, <laughs> if I wanted to do that. But I, 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 can't, I can't do that. But, uh, but he did say so many wonderful things. Um, and, he, and among them were, he says, I believe, I don't believe in carrying those who can walk, neither do I believe in refusing a hand to those who stumble. I believe instead that all of us must accept responsibility for ourselves, our families, and our communities. And if we are fortunate enough to be chosen for public office, we must accept the responsibility of making difficult decisions. We don't get to choose the times in which we live, but we do get the chance to determine how we respond to those times. We can consign our children to inadequate schools, or we can choose to make our schools better. And we know what choices uh, Governor Florio made. Now, as to the gentleman on the end, uh, he, uh, he, I think he was an assemblyman before one of the many redistrictings in, in, uh, in the state of New Jersey, and he actually was an assemblyman in covering Plainfield, uh, at, yes. at one, and that's where I lived and live now. And he came to call me the troublemaker. I mean, he never called me by name. Ah, the troublemaker. I see him in a diner for a cup of coffee. Ah, oh, the troublemaker. Well, when I, believe it or not, you see this kindly old man before you. In years gone by, I was a troublemaker. I admit it. I admit it. Uh, let me just uh, uh, point out to you uh, that book uh, uh, sitting right there. Is there a book sitting there? Could you hold that book up? This is the last thing I want to say. That's a newly published book entitled uh, Other People's Children, The Battle for Justice and Equality in New Jersey's Public Schools. And that's going to be a, a kind of as a follow-up to this meeting. That's going to be a follow-up on January 29th to, the, uh, to this meeting because the subject is the same. And I'm delighted to say that, uh, I want to point out that the author of that book, Deborah Yaffe, is here, and she's going to appear on January 29th, and we're going to extend and continue this discussion. And now to get right to it, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, the uh, president of the Century Foundation and the moderator for this morning, Richard Leone. <laughs> Thanks, Herb, that was actually for years, I thought the Abbott decision was a little boring and unpleasant to talk about. It's been dying for its Costello, and we finally found it. <laughs> uh, 
This is a topic that goes back deep into the roots of New Jersey politics in the 1960s. I'm going to take just one minute to remind people of what state government was like here 40 years ago. Many of you know this. New Jersey spent less per capita at the state level than any other state in the country. It was 50th in state spending. It was 50th in state aid to local governments and schools. It was the last state in the country to join the Medicaid program. It was the last state in the country to join the food stamps program. <laughs> it, was the, it was 50th in support for higher education. So whatever is true about how important money is, it is clear that at the beginning of this story, New Jersey, by the standards of the United States of America, wasn't spending enough money on a great many things. Now, the reasons for that lie deep in the political history of the state. We're not going to take any time with them today, I don't think, because there's enough excitement in the last 40 years uh, to take care. And, and I think I should say about these last 40 years, this is, we're all getting grayer and older. So view this as a time capsule you're getting a little peek at, and the younger members of the audience among you will be the ones who have to keep alive the memory of what these fights are all about and why they happened. But one of the reasons they happened whatever is true about how important money is or isn't in education, is we simply weren't spending a lot of money at the state level. In 1965, New Jersey had neither a sales nor an income tax. So it was a very different government, very different political system from the one we know today. And in many ways, the political history of the last 40 years, when it's summarized in some big book that <coughs> covers hundreds of years, will say it was about two things. Won't seem that way for those of us who lived through it, but they'll say it was about taxes and education. And they're intimately related, intimately related. The income tax, for example, was dedicated to state aid. All of that money goes to state aid. The sales tax, which came in under Governor Hughes after he failed to get an income tax, was mostly state aid. Uh, so it, it still seems like the property taxes are very high. We spend a lot in the state. Uh, but it is not because we haven't greatly increased the size of state government at great political cost to courageous governors who tried to do it. Hughes had a very difficult time. Bill Cahill, among other things, was deeply hurt uh, by his advocacy of an income tax, lost the par primary in his own party. Governor Byrne, as, as has been mentioned, a sitting governor was renominated with 28 percent of the Democratic vote in the primary. We needed all those other people to be running against him to have a chance to win uh, because the taxes were so unpopular. Governor Florio undertook a massive reorganization of the tax and education system. Go Governor Kane had the state take over the pensions and health benefits of teachers, which are paid for at the state level. Some people think that makes it even more difficult. And Go Governor DeFrancesco in vastly increased the amount of money that went out for that purpose, along with other things. So all these men, and this so far is just men, maybe that's why it's such a mess, I don't know, but so far it's just men have lived through this for a long time, they have a lot to say. Uh, I will just spend one minute on the educational foundation of all these decisions. Back in the 1960s there was a report by, called the Coleman Report, which became the seminal document in looking at what matters in schools. Just to remind everybody Technically speaking, the Coleman report seemed to indicate that it didn't matter very much what went on in the schools. It, very, mat very, it mattered very much who you went to school with. And that became the foundation, the justification for the enormous battles about school integration and busing and other things. We still know limited numbers of things about how to transform kids into good students who start out with handicaps along those lines, difficulties in becoming good students. We know that it still matters a lot who they go to school with. We know that money must matter. Of course, we believe very strongly in our society that money can be a proxy for all sorts of other things. We're an economy, we're a country, really, uh, whose basic philosophy is, was originated in lawyers and I would argue has been taken over by economists and it's driven by things we can quantify. One of the things we can quantify is money. And one of the things the court in New Jersey, which has been unique, although half the states have had decisions about funding, and a couple have done Massachusetts, Connecticut have done important things in recent years. 
New Jersey is unique in the extent and, and, and perseverance and importance of the court in taking over this, this place of we will judge when you're doing enough and largely judge it in terms of money, which has made that an important decision uh, for all of us and continues to be. If you're like me and you get confused about which is Abbott 6 and which is Abbott 4 and what's the difference between Abbott 3 and how did Abbott 5 come along, we'll try and stay away from all that today. And we'll go right now to uh, the first of our governors who's going to, oh, excuse me, we're going to go first of all to somebody who I think knows more about the educational issues, not just the history, but the educational issues involved than anybody in the state. Gordon McInnes was an assemblyman, a senator, head of New Jersey Public Television. He wrote a terrific book called uh, Wrong for All, for All the Right Reasons, uh, which I would commend to you. And he worked, uh, labored for decades in education, including most recently as the, as the top state official for the Abbott districts until he left. And he's a fellow here at uh, the Woodrow Wilson School. And he will help encapsulate this history and sort us through that time. Gordon. Good morning. Uh, the idea that I'm going to limit myself to 15 minutes and to discuss Abbott is uh, terrifying to me, and it probably will be at the end to you as well. Um, but I'm going to try. And I'll be very uh, quick to jump to trying to set a perspective for this morning's discussion. Let me start with two uh, blazing generalizations that I won't try and defend, but please accept them as truth. First, New Jersey is uniquely positioned to be the first state in the union to have a decent chance to close the achievement gap. Uh, we have, <clears throat> because of Abbott, we have adequate resources to carry out that work. And because of Abbott, we have something very special, which is that we offer children in 31 very poor districts the opportunity to start school at the age of three. And that is an essential step, I believe, in closing the achievement gap. The districts involved in Abbott for the past, uh, well, particularly for the past 10 or 11 years in terms of funding, have the resources, if they are spent in the appropriate way, to show dramatic progress in closing the gap. And I offer that as a, as a, as a starting point and, a, as I said, a blazing generalization. Secondly. Uh, I suggest that Abbott is no longer sustainable politically, financially, or morally. That we cannot politically see as a permanent situation a program under which 60% of the operating state aid goes to districts where only 20% of the students are found. And incidentally, where only 20% of the taxpayers and 20% of the voters are found. I don't think over time that that is sustain sustainable, and I think the governor's uh, yet uh, recommendation of this week puts that into context. Secondly, New Jersey can't afford to maintain that system. The state is close to broke, at least in the, in the words used by the current governor and his immediate predecessor, uh, and the idea that we're going to be able to extend the Abbott idea across the board to dozens of other districts is not financially something that can be done. And finally, it's not sustainable morally. The Supreme Court wanted poor children in this state to have an opportunity to be given the same choices in life that middle class kids have. That's what Abbott is about. And you can only do that if you're well educated. And you cannot have a system where half of the kids who are poor are not included. And that's what we've reached today, which is that 49.8% of the kids who are eligible for free and reduced lunch in New Jersey don't live in the Abbott districts. And that change is, is, is a slow one. It's taking place over time, but the direction is very clear. And if we want to deal with the problems of, of, of poor children growing up in concentrated poverty, we're going to have to take a different approach. Let me just make three observations. Uh, about Abbott. Uh, these are 
fairly simple and obvious points, and you'll probably be scratching your head and saying, why in the presence of these governors is he taking our time to talk about these, about these issues? Uh, but they're frequently neglected in the discussion of Abbott. It's real easy to forget some of these things. First, the court has ordered that the state and the districts do something that's never been done. No district, uh, with the possible exception of two New Jersey districts, have ever, has ever succeeded over time in closing the achievement gap when they are charged with educating concentrations of poor kids. It's never happened. We've been talking about this for 40 years in this nation. It began with the Coleman Report. Uh, it has continued through the enactment of Title I. It has continued through dozens of boards, commissions, the terms of education governors, the terms of education presidents. Uh, the fact is that that gap, while it narrowed noticeably in the years in the uh, 70s and into the 80s, it has largely stagnated. And it has stagnated at a very wide margin. And the reason is that the, that the job of educating kids who grow up in poverty is just much harder. And we need to be clear and specific and concrete about that fact. The Coleman Report, in addition to what Dick mentioned, which found that one of the key characteristics that define the differences in how uh, how kids ended up being educated was who they went to school with, but the first finding was who did they grow up with and what family did they grow up. And that is a problem that we have now documented in elaborate detail subsequently. And we know, for example, that at the age of three, a child growing up in a poor family has heard 30 million fewer words than a child growing up with two college graduates is his or her parent, parents. 30 million fewer words. ETS just published a report this week which points out the differences between, for example, the time spent reading stories to children before, the, uh, before they go off to kindergarten, the time spent watching television. All of these factors have an enormous influence on what happens when kids show up at the, at the schoolhouse door at the age of five. And that gap needs to be understood. It needs to be treated by the public school districts with greater urgency than most of them treat it. But it needs to govern our conversation that this is really, really hard work. It's not that it can't be done, but it's really difficult, and we need to be clear about why. Secondly, we need to stop looking for panaceas. As the, as the answer to this problem. Again, we've had 40 years of all sorts of recommendations. Educational TV was supposed to take care of this problem. Um, so was something called school-based budgeting. Uh, so was the open classroom. So was uh, any number of uh, recommendations and enthusiasms. You could put vouchers on that list. Uh, there are lots of things that have been put forward as the answer. They don't work. They don't work for the 100% of kids who are, or the 90% of kids who are not affected by some of these programs that might help with 10%. We need, we need answers that deal with the, the 100%, not the 10%. And in, in that light, I would say that <clears throat> we have evidence about what works. Uh, and that would be my third point. It's so simple. You've heard it so often uh, that I hesitate to repeat it this morning. But in fact, what we're talking about is pedagogy. There are two things that will allow us to close the achievement gap. And I say this because we are looking at places where the gap is being closed. And what we find there is is a culture that shares certain practices and policies and approaches, none of which can be encapsulated into an off-the-shelf program that you can grab and install in public school 11 and expect to see results. They all require a lot of work. Different work than is going on in most classrooms where poor kids go to school because if what, we're, what is going on in those classrooms was effective, 
we would have seen that gap close much more than it has. So we need to change what happens in classrooms. I mentioned that there are a couple of districts where we've really seen um, evidence that this is not a delusion, talking about closing the achievement gap. Uh, West New York and Union City may be the only two city districts in the country that have sustained gains that were made with younger children at fourth grade because lots of districts have shown that they can do that, that they can raise the percentage of kids who can read and write. But typically those gains fall off by the middle grades. So our eighth grade results are very different. In fact, our eighth grade results in New Jersey's poor districts are pretty flat since the eighth grade exam was introduced in 1999. In Union City, uh, in eighth grade math, seven years ago, the gap between Union City kids and the New Jersey average was 26 percentage points. Last year, it was 0.6 of 1%. I'd say that's pretty close to closing the gap. In language arts, the gap went from 23 points to three points, and I'd make the same point, the same case. And we've also seen that in a number of Abbott districts that the ability to greatly increase the percentage of kids who are, who are competent readers by third and fourth grade, uh, those districts have shown dramatic progress in the last five or six years. Districts like Orange, Vineland, Perth Amboy, uh, East Orange, Elizabeth, Jersey City. Uh, so we have a range of districts with different demographics and economics showing that this is work that can be done effectively. And what do they do? They all do pretty much the same thing. First of all, they set academics as the primary goal. That's what they pay attention to. That's how they judge principals. That's how they evaluate schools. And they're very clear about what's expected. They have a road map that teachers, parents, and students can understand about what it is they're expected to learn. If they're a third grader and it's March, this is where you should be in math. This is where you should be in language arts. And they track all the time. They're always gathering evidence, not just state tests, because that information comes in much too late and in a forum that's frankly not useful. Uh, they track all the time with their own assessments about how kids are doing over this eight week period. And they use that information to change what happens with classroom instruction. They work with the teachers. Look at these kids in your class, they've got these problems. This is how we, let's try this approach with those kids. They, they support teachers. They understand that what happens in classrooms is the only thing that counts in the end. And so they, the teachers are very much a part of the changes that take place in instruction. They obviously have to be a part of it. And they adjust instruction. And they keep tracking. And they readjust instruction. This is difficult work, but it can be done. Now, the, the one consistent measure that we've been employing since 1971 to judge how well kids are doing is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And we could argue about some of the psychometrics of it or whatever, but it does provide us a fairly consistent and uniform measure of how well kids are doing. In 2007, fourth graders in New Jersey uh, went to uh, the number two position in the country. Only fourth graders in Massachusetts perform better. And Massachusetts is not nearly as diverse as New Jersey is. It doesn't have nearly the same concentration of poor kids that New Jersey has. And none of the states that are in the top five or ten do. This is really a fairly remarkable achievement. It's just one year of the test. But of the 52 jurisdictions that take the NAEP, looking at the three the three groups that we look at, Latinos, African Americans, and whites, New Jersey was the only one of those 52 states where all three groups improved between 2005 and 2007. And the jump by African American students was 13 scale points, which is a remarkable, remarkable jump in a, in a two-year period. And the fact is that it's a sample test and all of that. 
But there is no other subgroup in any other state that improved by a greater margin than African Americans in New Jersey. Latinos improved by eight percentage, by eight scale points, whites by six points. And what does that suggest? It suggests that, in fact, we can see uh, hope that resources well spent can make a big difference. Resources poorly spent make no difference. And there's the other side of that story, and it needs to be told that the, a lot of districts, a lot of Abbott districts, have greatly increased their funding while their educational performance has stagnated or even declined. And we have a pattern. It's not a, it's not a precise scientific connection that the higher performing districts tend to be among the lower spending and the lowest performing tend to be among the highest spending. I think there's a reason for that. But I, I believe that unfortunately it's those latter examples that receive so much public attention that it's contaminated the debate about Abbott. And we need to pay attention to the fact that we've made some dramatic progress and we have hope that this, this uh, intelligent use of resources will work. I think that's enough. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm next. Governor Byrne. Well, first of all, let me lament the fact that Governor McGreevy isn't here. I, I think he was an educational governor. Uh, the, the morning of his, uh, or the day of his inaugural, he, uh, he immediately adjourned and read books to kids. So uh, he, he would have made a contribution, and I understand that he, some conflict developed at the last minute, and he didn't make it. Uh, I want to I say a couple of things before I speak. <laughs> One is that I'm the only living governor of New Jersey who went through the New Jersey public school system. And I get credit for that. Right? <laughs> and, and if we were 50th in the, in the country at that time, so what? <laughs> Couple of other, couple of other observations I like. To, I'm not going to be too long because you know I don't know much about education. Uh, I think we're talking to the wrong people. Uh, uh, how, how many of you have ever taught school? You, you did a little bit, didn't you? But but not school kids. School kids. <laughs> Good. Any, any of you ever read a book by Frank McCourt called Teacher Man? Some of you, some of you. The point he, one of the points he, well, first of all, let me, let me talk about Frank McCourt because he's a buddy of mine. He, he taught in two separate schools in New York. One was uh, where he was dealing totally with people who all he had to do was discipline. He really couldn't teach. And it was a question of, of getting those kids through the day. And then the second opportunity he had was to teach at Stuyvesant High, where he got the talented students and he was able to teach them. Now, it was the same Frank McCourt who was different students. And so, let's, let's take a look for a minute at what he has to say about how you approach the educational problems. He says, talk to the teachers. Talk to the people who are in the classrooms dealing with these kids. And I, and I think he comes out with the conclusion that you've got to get them very early. And so we've recognized that in New Jersey, and we're starting to put money into the three-year-olds and for where I think 
uh, it will make a difference. And, and after, after a certain age, it becomes a lot more difficult to, uh, to turn a kid around. Uh, if he's on the right track, and, and you see it. I mean, I have grandchildren uh, now, and by the time they're three or four, they're well on the way. I, I took my four-year-old to Powell's cabin the other day, and she's looked at the menu, and she said she wanted chicken fingers. Now she read the menu, and the menu said chicken fingers. And now there are a lot of kids that age who can't read at all. And so that's why I think that you got to get them early, and you got to get not only the kids, you got to get the you got to get the parents, you got to get the parents reading to them. And I guess. I guess the point I'm making here is that a lot depends on what you do with parents. And so I would, I would put my, and one other point I'm, I make is when we talk about school funding, we talk about how many dollars we need. I have never seen really a discussion of what we need it for. Uh, my, my son wrote an op-ed piece for the ledger early this week in which he pointed out that thorough and efficient are two words and that we ought to look at, at both the money that goes into it and the program, that, what, what the money pays for. I, I do think that we got to start looking at what the money pays for. And so, uh, I, got in, I got into thorough and efficient pretty early. At the time that I took office in 1974, uh, Robertson versus Cahill uh, was the law. People believed that we needed funding for education. People supported, in the long run, supported the state income tax because they believed it was going to do something. It was going to do something for kids. It was going to do something for education. People no longer believe that. They no longer believe that money solves educational problems. And as Gordon said, you're not going to get them to keep advocating more and more money for education. You've got to, you've got to have people believing that we're doing something and what the, the hundreds and, and millions of dollars that have gone into education since my days in West Orange High School uh, are, are making a difference. And, and we don't see it. And maybe we can't see it. Maybe, maybe by the time we get kids into the public schools, they're too far gone. And I urge you to talk to not former governors, but people who've been on the classroom. I had a daughter who taught here in Princeton for a couple of years. She, she got a degree at Princeton. She got her she got her Harvard master's degree. She taught in a classroom. Nobody listens to her, uh, but she probably knows more than anybody in this room about what happens in the classroom and how you might be able to uh, use those experiences to do something different and something better. So I, I come here more to listen to what's going on today and, uh, and to respond to the fact that we, we in 1974, and, and Dick Leone is the guy who put together the, he won't tell you, the, uh, <laughs> the first state income tax. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, we, and we believed it then. We believed it then. We don't believe it. At least I don't believe it now. Governor Florio is going to go next. Thank you and good morning to um, everyone. 
Governor uh, Byrne laments the fact that Governor McGreevy is not here. I always lament the fact when Governor Kane doesn't show up. Because the sequence is, I always have a buffer between me and Governor Byrne and Governor Kane. And Governor Kane is much easier to follow than Governor Byrne is. But I'm um, establishing the precedent of trying to establish your credentials for even being here. Um, I am um, a graduate of what was then Trenton State Teachers College. Um, I'm also married to a teacher, um, so I have a little bit of credentials. And going to public schools was something I did, but not in New Jersey. I went to public school um, in um, New York, in Brooklyn. Uh, I went to a very good school, by the way, Erasmus Hall High School, and the school system, hooray for Erasmus. <laughs> the system um, was a very, very good one at that time, substantially different than it is now, in terms of things would not be politically acceptable to have different grades in different schools for the smart kids and the dumb kids. And that was the way that things were dealt with. I, also have to confess that I didn't finish high school, I quit high school, went into the Navy, got my GED diploma. Um, then I went to Trenton State Teachers College. But became involved and um, very much you know, committed to education because I lived a life of having an affordable quality education available to me. Trenton State Teachers College tuition was $150 a semester when I went there. And I was only able to afford it because I got the Korean War GI Bill $70 a month, which allowed me to go and get a good quality education at an affordable rate. When I came into office, obviously Governor Byrne, Governor Kane had been through a little bit of this um, process of trying to define what the policy was going to be in New Jersey to provide a quality education for all of our students. Robinson uh, versus Cahill established the basic premise that there was something fundamentally wrong and unconstitutional about assigning to a child the quality education that um, came with the accident where they lived, saying over-dependence upon local property taxes to finance education when there was such a variation town by town by town was not acceptable under the Constitution. And that was something that we, um, and Governor Kane, or Governor Byrne rather, led the effort to try to have more state monies put into the process so as to equalize the opportunity, the opportunity to be able to have a quality education for all of our children. Abbott versus Burke started to put some flesh on the bones of how it is you do that. But the court, very modestly and perhaps correctly, at the outset said, we don't know what the actual indicators are for good educational outcomes for all our young people across the whole state. But what we do know is that the high-performing districts happen to be affluent, and the underperforming districts happen to be very, very unfunded and very poor. Therefore, in light of that, those uncontrovertible, uncontrovertible facts, what we have a, uh, going for us is an understanding that money is a difference. And so therefore, what we're going to do is say that the state has to contribute to the funding to bring the lowest performing districts, the so-called Abbott districts, up to the highest performing districts. And that will be the, the shorthand for our effort to move to equity. And I guess the good news is that over this period of time, from then to now and hopefully into the future, research at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, has given us more insight into what are good educational, educational outcomes. How is it that we can be more specific than just talking about pure money as being a dividing line between good and underperforming? And so over the years, we've um, come to understand that, and particularly for young children in the lower grades, class size is a determiner of outcomes. By the way, that also entails money because class size and money, there's a correlation there. Quality education, quality uh, educators, quality teachers is an indicator of good outcomes. And therefore, that's something we should start building into our systems of educational funding. Um, the whole idea of um, uh, kindergarten is a good place. In the Abbott districts, kindergarten was something we early on said ought to be obtained for those young people. 
Um, we had a bunch of school construction. The quality of the physical facility was a good indicator of outcome. I can recall when I was governor going to Patterson, finding in Patterson you had 100-year-old schools, wooden schools, schools that didn't have a computer in the whole school. Where in other areas around the state, we had computers for the young people in the classes. So all of those types of things were the indicators that we've started to try to build in, and they do translate into money in some respects. But we have a better sense of what we have to do to be able to get good educational outcomes. Which brings us down to where we are now, because what the governor is doing is to say, all of those things we've tried to build into the system should not just be for districts. We're really about children. We picked districts at the outset because it was neat. It was manageable. It was something that you could evaluate easily. With technology, with the capability, and with the insights and the research that we have now, we can go to individual pupils. And so what the governor's formula, as I read it in the newspapers, is, is about saying that we want to treat children as children and those who are at risk, in need of all of these things we've identified. Preschool being the one that is, I happen to believe uh, is most significant, as Governor Byrne pointed out. Um, I've got 10 grandchildren. They're in three different families. All of them ranging from 1 to 18 have had families that right from the very beginning have inculcated into them the importance of reading, the importance of books, the importance of education. And if every child in this state could get the benefit of those types of backgrounds in education or in their families, we would have quantum leaps forward in terms of educational opportunity. So I think that the proposal that we have now to start talking about children who are in need of assistance to be able to have them get a thorough and efficient education is really the direct way to go. And I'll just conclude by saying, as, as always is the case, money is the problem. How do you go about saying that money can be raised to do the things that we want to do? I'm always struck by the folks who say money is not a consideration. <coughs> the folks in the districts who have the money never volunteer to give the money away, so money obviously appears to be somewhat important to some people. <laughs> and I guess the, um, the thing that I see now, and I read again, this is no inside scoop, I read in the newspapers that the governor is talking about half a billion dollars in additional money to finance this expanded scope of um, uh, distribution of resources. And again, I'm not sure, and the question was one of the skeptics or critics said, where's the money going to come from? And I will just make an observation that one of the things that the governor is talking about is this monetization plan. The monetization plan is designed to, as I understand it, reduce debt by 50%, going from 30 billion to 15 billion. Obviously, that money should be used for debt reduction, capital expenditures. But every year in the operating budget is anywhere from one to two billion dollars for um, paying off bonded indebtedness to the degree that the asset monetization plan works as I suspect it's supposed to work, reducing the ability to carry that debt. We now have operating funds that can be used for other things in the operating budget and I would suggest that nothing would be more important than being able to use some of that money to fund the half a billion dollars in additional monies that are required to be carrying out this plan. So hopefully we'll get through this, um, this year, set a new direction that will be a better direction, an improved direction, move us uh, down the road to provide a cost-effective, thorough and efficient education for all of our students. Thank you. Governor DeFrancesco. Thank you very much. And uh, I am always the last one to uh, <laughs> speak. And generally, it's with these two other giants of politics, former governors, Governor Byrne and Governor Florio. I, too, was hoping that Governor McGreevy would be here. I was hoping that uh, Tom Kane and Christy Whitman would be here to uh, enlighten us on, on their views and their experiences and their administrations. And uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, unlike, uh, with the exception of Dick Cody, unlike other governors, to have served in the legislature under four governors, Byrne, Kane, 
Florio Whitman. So I was able to firsthand see what was, you know, what was going on, not only in education, but generally in, in politics in New Jersey. And, and of course, as uh, Dick Leon had said, uh, we've come a really long way from, uh, from when I first was voting as a 21-year-old, uh, I guess for Richard Nixon, I, I don't remember, but I think that might have been the first election I ever voted in. Uh, and uh, because I had uh, relatives who were locally involved in politics, uh, somehow I knew a little bit about local politics. But I was listening to Gordon, and uh, you know, I was thinking because you were saying that kids that are disadvantaged, uh, perhaps uh, studies show that they haven't had the benefit of 30 million words. I think you said prior to kindergarten. Well, my parents were from Italy, and didn't say much to me. Uh, those first few years, and I was wondering if I had had that advantage. Maybe I've been governor more than one year, you know? Maybe I would have had the benefit of those extra years, but uh, I, had a, uh, I had three older sisters and an older brother, and my oldest sister was at Douglas College when I was born. Uh, I don't think it was called Douglas College at that time. It was called the New Jersey College for Women. And uh, when I got to... Uh, grade school, my father made me go to this brand new Catholic school for eight years called St. Bart's in Scotch Plains. Uh, we had such a big Italian family, we called it Scotch Plains, you know, that's the way we pronounce it, <laughs> in our household. Um, and my sister, who was at Douglas, she used to yell and scream about why am I going to Catholic school? You're not getting as good an education as you would in public school, because she was a teacher, and a uh, well, strong believer, and she taught in Plainfield, a strong believer, and public school education, so when I got out of that Catholic school, I went right to the public high school in Scotch Plains and had a great experience there, and then went on to uh, college and fortunate enough to have gone to law school. But um, I was in the legislature for 26 years, and I've met many of you while I was in, involved in that process. Um, and all of you are much more have much more expertise than I do in, on, on these issues, particularly this issue. I see Steve Adubato over here taking notes. I'm a little nervous when he's taking notes when I'm speaking. <laughs> but, uh, or he's doodling, you know, like, what's this guy talking about? And, and a few others that I have worked with. But I came into the legislature, and I know everybody feels that their time was the most exciting, when Governor Byrne was governor. And when he ran for office in 1973, if some of you will recall, not all of you, because some of you are really young, uh, he swept in, for a variety of reasons, a lot of Democrats. There's one over there, I think, right, right, Gordon? And I'm not saying he swept you in. You were obviously well qualified. Uh, <laughs> we had a great campaign, but the other people. Right. And he had this huge number of uh, Democrats in the assembly, 66, I believe, out of 80. A huge number of Democrats in the Senate, I think 31 out of 40. And an overwhelming majority. And, and I wasn't in politics at that time. And I had voted in the primary for Governor Cahill, though he lost the primary, and made a few calls for him at the behest of my uncle. And um, Two years later, they were looking for candidates to run on the Republican Party because everybody was wiped out in, in the legislature. And because I had all these relatives in Scotch Plains, uh, and that, that Scotch Plains was a major part of the district at that time, somebody asked me to run for the assembly. And that's what happened. That's pretty much what happened. I never served as mayor or freeholder, never had that opportunity or any other office, but I was thrust into this assembly in the election of 75 and, and seated in January of 76 and immediately the governor proposes, well no, I don't think the governor proposed it that year, I think he let the legislature propose it, this income tax. I think you decided that you were going to sit back, I think the governor Byrne was going to sit back and let the legislative leaders, and there's a man who was there with me, not with me, but with uh, legislative leaders, deal with this issue of funding T&E. And it was an amazing year. It was a 1976, uh, besides being the bicentennial 
Uh, it was an amazing year politically because I was able to sit back as a little guy in the assembly in the back row watching uh, the leaders of the legislature try to deal with this difficult issue of enacting an income tax for the first time in New Jersey, which are, I, I think Governor Cahill had proposed and Governor Byrne had proposed in an effort to deal with this issue of funding for not only schools but generally in our budget. Uh, and, and I watched and I learned. You know, one thing uh, I've always said to kids, particularly college kids, is that don't think that the people that sit in the legislature, pardon me for saying this, Gordon, are all Rhodes Scholars, that they're all valedictorians, that they're wonderful people who know everything about any issue. They don't, you have to assume that they don't know anything about the issue you're talking about. So I became educated in 1976 on a variety of issues uh, around the state of New Jersey that I had never even dreamed about before, whether it be in human services or education or what have you. And it was a great experience for me, those first couple of years. Uh, the schools were closed. I read one of the her, her schools were closed theoretically on July 1st of uh, 1976. I don't know what kind of impact that had on the legislature, but the income tax was passed. Uh, Governor Byrne let us go on July 4th to celebrate uh, July 4th, and we had to come back. And it was one of those weeks where, and you've read about those weeks where you have to be there around the clock, around the clock, around the clock. And it passed, was enacted, and I guess, Dick, I think at the time, and I'm doing this by recall now, everyone thought, well, this is probably going to help solve the funding crisis for education in New Jersey. And my recollection was that obviously there was an infusion of a tremendous amount of money in the beginning. But the formula, whatever that formula was, grew rapidly, grew rapidly. And the cap on suburban spending, I'll call it suburban spending, I mean the cap on spending in other districts lasted about five minutes, right? It, I mean, it's the Teachers Association, et cetera, lobbied hard to get that lifted. And so that went by the wayside and spending increased every year. And as spending increased every year in the suburban districts, the, the need to fund the Abbott districts increased because they were tied. So the school district in Short Hills and I'll say Milburn Township, as they spent more money, so did the need to fund the Abbott districts and that created you know, issues over the years as there were recessions from time to time. This wasn't a formula that was geared to, you know, how much revenue was coming into the treasury. It was designed specifically to deal with what is everybody spending around the state? What are the higher income or the wealthier districts spending so that the Abbott districts could keep up with those districts? And they did through various court decisions, through various tax increases, et cetera. In fact, I, you know, I voted for taxes, I voted against taxes. I was there 26 years. I mean, remember on uh, uh, Governor Kane was governor. It was a difficult couple of years in the beginning and uh, almost on New Year's Eve or something like that of 1982, we passed, we raised the income tax and we raised the sales tax, I think, at the same time. And uh, he signed it. He'd probably would never tell you that, but he signed it. And uh, <laughs> right, Jim, he would never admit to that. In fact. I was with, uh, I don't know where I was with uh, Assemblyman Doyle when, when he signed it. And, and even though I thought, and I was the Senate Minority Leader at the time, the early 80s, I thought we were doing Governor Kane a favor by raising these taxes. When he signed it, he was very smart politically when he signed it. He said, I'm going to sign it with holding my nose. I'm going to sign these bills. I really hate these bills, but I'm going to sign them because I guess we have no choice. And I said to John, I said, wow. <laughs> I voted for this, you know, and, and uh, I learned a lot about politics that day, too. And uh, so as the years went on, the need for increased funding just kept going up and up and up. And, and it's been very difficult to keep up. And Gordon addressed a lot of this. And it was very difficult to deal with the courts, too. I mean, you weren't, well, a lot of my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans over the years were screaming, hollering, shouting, yell about this formula and why do we have to do this and why do we have to do this and why doesn't their district get more money and, and you know the only answer you had is because the court won't allow us to do the things you want us to do because the Abbott districts 
are funded through T&E and it's through a formula that is pretty much, was pretty much untouchable. As we got into the 90s and Governor Florio uh, legislatively addressed uh, a, a, lot, a lot of issues uh, dealing with education through, through the Quality Education Act and, and while controversial, his motivation and his intentions were unbelievably pure and idealistic and been right. Uh, and I, believe it or not, I, I was lucky enough to, to be elected Senate President because of him. Uh, <laughs> um, and I can say that then because we are friends. And, I, and, and uh, I'll never forget this. Uh, you know, uh, I was in the, uh, he had won an election. I've been in, I thought I'd been in the Senate a long time. I mean, based on some of the colleagues that I left, when I left the Senate that were still there, I hadn't been there a long time. But, I mean, 10 years seemed like a long time to me, being one in the minority in the Senate. And I was finally saying, gee, you know, maybe I should do something else with my life. And then when I saw that Christy Whitman almost beat Bill Bradley, talking about Rhodes Scholars, uh, I said, wow, we, we might win the legislature next year. And sure enough, we did. And um, I was fortunate enough to be picked as the president, future president of the Senate in January of 92 to work with Governor Florio in 92 and 93. And funny how these things happen. I mean, you have all these people who, you know, you're trying to get press, you're trying to get your picture in a paper, you're trying to do this. And then, of course, once that happened, I was trying not to have my picture in a paper anymore. But, um, once I, I, an article appeared in the New York Times, and I won't go into details, but the title of the article was Mr. Bland Goes to Trenton, me. Uh, um, George uh, Will called me. I thought it was another uh, John Russo joke. Senator Russo used to call, uh, have people call me with uh, all kinds of different names. But uh, it wasn't a joke. George Will called me, the, the columnist, and he said, uh, you know, I read this article in the New York Times about Mr. Bland goes to Trenton, and I'm intrigued by this, and I'd like to write a column about it, and, and about, about Jim, Jim and I, I guess, uh, how you got to be president of the Senate because of these circumstances. So he said, uh, could I meet with you? And we met here at Princeton University. Uh, I think he was involved somehow. He would come here he once a while. He would be more on. comfortable in this year. Yeah. We met here, and he wrote a column of how this man, through his courage and through his drive, had done this, this, and this. And as a result of that, this guy was lucky enough to get to be president of the Senate. And that was the gist of his column. And of course, you may not have this experience, or you may, but when something like that appears around the country, you're bound to get a high school classmate write to you and say, are you really this guy? Are you really president of the Senate <laughs> in New Jersey? You? You know, you, I got a couple letters like that. Um, so uh, I guess uh, if I could quickly just mention a couple of things while I was president of the Senate and Governor Florio and Governor Whitman were governor and then I had one year as governor. Um, a lot of the focus continued to be on Abbott. Uh, we, we, did, we did agree to... Uh, uh, fund and, and mandate preschool education and, and uh, in the Abbott districts and I thought that was a great thing. I visited a number of pre, uh, preschools and a number of schools dealing with that and, and I found that that was at least something uh, that appeared to be having great results. And I think uh, all everybody has mentioned that. And, and results in a variety of ways, not just in kids learning to read and write, but identifying problems with kids. Uh, whether they need glasses, uh, a prescription for such and such, other problems, not just educational problems. You get kids with teachers and they recognize, well, this child has this problem, this child has that problem. Let's help them now at, at three years old instead of five. And so I was really impressed with that. Yes, it's expensive, but I thought it was well worth the money. And, you know, the problem with legislators in the legislature is they view themselves as being there short term. So they're, generally speaking, their focus is short term. So repealing the death penalty or enacting the death penalty, that's a major issue, one or the other. But dealing with kids' education because 
it's hard to find, quantify the results. It takes years, and maybe you never know what the results are of your efforts. You know, that's not as good as building a road in your community, or, you know, or this or that. So, so you have to continue to, to lobby to deal with kids' problems, even though you won't, may not be able to see the results of your programs for 10 years. So I found that preschool education was a great thing. And it's a great thing if it can be done uh, even at a, a much a wider uh, degree. School construction issue. We, I was involved in that. And uh, I didn't mind doing that. In fact, I, uh, we had a, um, the speaker and I had a disagreement over the amount of the percentage of, of funding. We took the position that in the Abbott districts, we would pay 100%. He went to court and said we should only pay the percentage they are getting of state aid from the state. I mean, he had a more you know, logical argument, but we thought that uh, for lack of money, these schools weren't going to do anything unless we gave them, school districts, unless we gave them 100%. We went out, we enacted a program, and I left. And of course, you know, it's easy for legislators, and I was one for many years, to pass bills and not worry about them after that and say we did this. And then, but implementing some of these programs are very difficult. Implementing some of this, implementing that program became very difficult. We expanded that program to include all the districts in some percentage or another. And a lot of schools have benefited from state aid for school construction. So I thought that was a great thing. And her, I, if it wasn't for me, Plainfield wouldn't be an Abbott district today because I insisted that Plainfield and Neptune be, be added to the Abbott districts. And I know that probably was just a, a tiny little uh, tip of the iceberg thing because I also knew at the time that there were a lot of other districts that needed help that, that could qualify for uh, substantial help if we had been able to revise that formula. But I felt all, all the years I was a legislator that Plainfield should be an Abbott district. And when I was in a position to do it, we did it. With respect to the governor's plan, um, I, think it's, I think it's fabulous if it can be implemented in a proper way. I, I think that, if, as I said, if you can identify poor kids who will benefit from preschool, uh, who don't have the, 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 the uh, uh, opportunity to do that now, uh, I think it's wonderful. It's the implementation that will, will be, you'll be bogged down in and, and will have uh, great difficulty in, in dealing with the districts or the facilities or the teachers, all of the arguments you'll read about. But I think that it, it uh, is, as a policy measure, it's a great idea. I, uh, I want to say it's been uh, an honor to uh, have been governor for one year. Uh, we had some difficult issues that year. 9-11 uh, occurred in that year, and there were some anthrax issues down in Hamilton uh, and a few other places. But it was a great honor to be there for that one year, and it was an honor to serve with Governor Florio, uh, serve with uh, Governor Byrne, uh, Kane and Whitman, uh, Jim McGreevy, who's been a close friend of mine for many, many years. Uh, I hope to see him today. Uh, and, but uh, uh, if I could just sum it up, I'd say uh, serving the legislature was uh, one of a great experience that I've had because I've learned so much about people in New Jersey, about life, and I've met so many people who are committed to wonderful issues, uh, helping particularly kids in unfortunate circumstances. And without that, uh, you know, I, I don't know where I'd be as a person today. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to open this up for questions in a minute. I just want to ask one uh, question. In addition to having served in government and as governors, all three of these men are lawyers and uh, have various times in their career taken that very seriously. Governor Byrne, of course, was a judge. The question I have is this. Has the court all these years, when it has defined the issues in education largely by a series of decisions, uh, in a particular way, has it overreached? Has it misinterpreted the role it should play in trying to do something about education? Has it taken this clause in the Constitution and expanded it into a uh, premise that for all educational decisions. And sure. Can I just say something quickly that uh, my observation um, about that is having the focus just on 
the school district, the school children, um, made sense at the time. What, what I personally observed, I mean, here you have like a Camden, Jim, a Camden, where the school district's getting tons of money as a result of the decision and over the years. They're getting a lot more money than they, they, they did, they'd had before. But the municipality was totally broke, uh, either because of incompetence uh, or just the lack of rateables, whatever the case may be. I think in a lot of the Abbott districts, that's been an issue that really never was dealt with properly, that you had, yes, the school district was receiving all this money, but the issues, the problems of the city still persisted year after year after year. And I'm not talking about Camden, but you know, there might be a situation where you had corrupt government in one town, incompetent government, um, lack of rate of votes, lack of funds in any way, bankruptcy, and the school district. And, and you can't, I don't think you can separate those two. Uh, I, I think they go hand in hand. I think you know, the, fam the family structure is just as important as, as having the teacher in the school, in the facility, uh, adequately funded. Yeah, Donnie makes the point. The point he just made is that in certain areas, nobody will do anything and so the court steps in. And that's exactly what's happened in education. I mean, the problem he talks about, the courts could, could move in tomorrow and say, hey, you got to do this, you got to do that, or it rises to a constitutional level. Uh, they did it in education. Did they overstep the bounds? Probably. Have they have they done uh, have they done more than they had to do? Maybe. Uh, incidentally, one of the issues that that, that came up in both Robinson versus Cahill and maybe Abbott is whether the right to a thorough and efficient education was based on the New Jersey Constitution or whether it was based on the federal constitution. The United States Supreme Court said in the Texas case that it was not based on the federal constitution. That doesn't stop the New Jersey Supreme Court from saying that it's based on a different provision of the New Jersey constitution. In other words, they can say that equal protection, the equal protection clause of the New Jersey constitution which doesn't exist, by the way, and they've imported uh, demands of thorough and efficient education. And so if, if the legislature ever decided to, to that, that we've gone too far and we're going to abolish the thorough and efficient clause in the state constitution, I think the New Jersey Supreme Court would, would go back and rely on the equal protection. So I don't think it's in danger from that standpoint. Yes, they may have gone too far. Uh, 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 yes, they could be doing something in other areas where the legislature just has, has default. The legislature, by the way, tends not to do anything. They really, they really, the, the desire is not to do anything. And the status quo is fine. And so when they do do something, they get criticized. When they don't do anything, they don't get criticized. <laughs> well, I mean, any society, there are certain values in the society that are generally codified in your fundamental documents, constitution, things of that sort. Um, quality education is something that I hopefully most societies would want to have for all the young people in that society. We have it embedded in our New Jersey society in our constitution. And then the, the realization of that goal traditionally falls into the three branches of government, each deciding what it is they're supposed to do in the process. The difficulty we've experienced in New Jersey and in the country uh, and around the world is with the problems that we're facing becoming so complex, so complicated, that the legislative branch of government doesn't appear to be almost up to the task. And that's why we're seeing more power gravitate to the executive branches of government. New Jersey started out that way. The executive branch in New Jersey is uniquely qualified and powerful to do those types of things. 
But this instance, we saw clearly um, the legislative branch wasn't up to dealing with the complexities of providing quality education to our young people. And so the judicial branch stepped in with some said more power and authority than it really had, but it filled the void. As we remember, they actually threatened to close the school. Fortunately enough, I think it was in June they threatened to close the school, so it was easy. Now, the threat was there, but it induced action um, in order to achieve the goal. Over the years, as I think we've been following, the judiciary is starting to be criticized in a lot of different contexts for being overly aggressive, for legislating outcomes rather than doing what they're theoretically supposed to be doing, which is resolving disputes. And so the new problem that we have is if the legislator, legislature is not up to the task of formulating responses to very, very complicated problems, and the judiciary is being more and more criticized for stepping into the void, how is it we're going to deal with these problems? And the new approach is to have the legislature trying to resolve problems by having a policy of conscious studied ambiguity. <laughs> they pass laws that have everybody being winners and no one ever thinking that they didn't win. And of course that means the ambiguity has got to be resolved at an administrative branch of government or ultimately in the judicial branch of government. So that's a societal problem we have, but the main goal is that the problems get resolved and whether it be executive driven, legislative driven, or judicial driven, that will be determined by the political process as to who we're going to be able to support to be able to resolve the problem that has to be resolved. One thing you, realize, you have to realize that there are three branches of government. Uh, if you can get, if you're the executive and you can get another branch on your side, you're way ahead. But you have to realize that. And, and when I not couldn't get the legislature, that. I got the judicial branch. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually taking a moment, worth taking a moment to relate the circumstances because not all of you will be intimately familiar with them. Governor Hughes, climax of Governor Hughes' eight years as governor was his struggle to get an income tax. He uh, failed by one vote in the Senate. He passed it in the Assembly and settled for the sales tax. The next governor was Governor Cahill, a Republican, who proposed an income tax and lost the primary in his own party. But before he left office, he appointed governor, former Governor Hughes as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. <laughs> so he was Chief Justice when Governor Byrne proposed the income tax and it was rejected by the legislature for two years running, actually almost three years running. That was when Governor Hughes led the court to the decision to close the schools. And it was that that put teeth in the whole threat to uh, do something, uh, something about education or, or else. And subsequent decisions certainly related to that. Now, those were unique circumstances where a couple of the branches seemed to commingle in some respects and led to a, a result that probably otherwise wouldn't have happened at that time, I think, uh, might have gone, the decision might have gone over. I would just say, in defense of the court's point of view, looked at, looked at from 30,000 feet, you could say this about New Jersey. It used to be in the middle of the pack, it's now the most wealthy state or second or third in the nation. He used to be well down in the pack on education, now spends the most on elementary and secondary education. And it gets excellent results. It graduates the most kids, it has a high, most kids do well going to college compared to the rest of the country. So from the court's point of view, they, if there were such a thing as a court over these generations, it might say, where did we go wrong? Maybe this was a blunt instrument. But the result is a wealthy state with high incomes with in general, very good educational outcomes. It is true that specifically in particular districts, in particular schools, and for specific children, of course, the outcomes aren't so great. But again, looked at from a statewide perspective, 
uh, following the implications of thorough and efficient education to their logical conclusion has not necessarily been a bad thing. It has chewed up a lot of politicians along the way because they've been stuck with implementation. But my question really was about the fact that one branch has called, called, called a tune and has defined for the other two branches, this will be the most important thing you deal with because of the way we define this problem. And that that has occurred over the 30, 40 years and has been very significant in terms of choices that governors and legislatures made. How do you fit taxpayer revolt into that picture? I think when you go from zero to 60, or zero statewide broad-based taxes to big statewide broad-based taxes, we have relatively high income taxes and we have relatively high sales taxes, you get a pet taxpayer revolt. I think that would there'd be something wrong with the democratic process if you didn't. People don't like to pay taxes. If over a period of years of living memory, taxes go up a lot, they're well, going to revolt against it. Will that cut back the judicial branch intrusion into the... That's what Mr. Dooley said. But uh, you tell me whether they read the papers or not. Yeah. Well, the, the quote from Mr. Dooley that I like most is, thank God we don't get all the government we pay for. <laughs> I'm going to open this up for questions and let the audience participate. And if you just, you can either direct it to a specific individual or to the panel in general. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Thomas Romer. I teach here at the Digital Ocean Support. I'm also involved in a project with some colleagues at the university. Uh, I'm with the Spencer Foundation, the Russell State Foundation. So, studying the evolution of inequality. Well, in some respects, I mean, you even see it in the newspapers, you're diffusing some of the adverse political pressure uh, that has been out there by virtue of talking and acknowledging the fact that there are middle districts as opposed to just dealing with the yeah. high-performing districts, yeah. affluent yeah. districts, yeah. and the Abbott districts. This system is designed to get money, an additional half a billion dollars apparently, um, into those districts that are in the middle that are felt uh, particularly ignored in light of the escalating monies that are going in 
And um, again, it is not only a political calculation, but it is a good substantive calculation that children are children. An at-risk child, depending upon where they live, is no less at risk than an at-risk child in one of the Abbott districts. So I think it happens to be a good policy initiative as well as a good political initiative. Isn't that what the governor is addressing as we speak? Yeah. Okay. I think part of your question, though, is what's likely to be the court's reaction to this, which yeah. is, this is a fundamental shift in focus uh, I, and I think would undo the focus yeah. that we've seen in Abbott over and over again. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Predecessor meeting to this one was with Supreme, retired Supreme Court, Court justices. We had uh, uh, the former chief Deborah Barnes and justices Gary Stein, James Coleman, and Alan Hammond. And the, uh, the following day, the ledger carrier story written by John Mooney, who may be here, but, um, but he wrote uh, three decades after the state Supreme Court began dramatically rearranging the landscape of New Jersey education funding, four retired jurists gathered yesterday for a frank discussion of how things have gone. With 30 decisions and billions of dollars poured into the state's poorest district, the history has been long and controversial. Court decisions closed the schools in 1976 and led to the creation of the income tax. And with state budgets tight and property taxes soaring, there has been pressure to retrench. They, the justices, are having none of None of the four appear to have softened their stand in the school equity cases, now best known as Abbott and Burke for the latest set of decisions that date back to the early 1990s. The cases led to orders for universal preschool, vast new programs in elementary and secondary schools, and billions in new construction and repairs for the state's 31 previous community. And then they go on to, uh, to point out that there have been significant improvements uh, in our schools as a consequence of the added funding from Abbott. And, and at least with these four, of course they're all retired, but with these four. So are we. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that you know, shapes your view on this. Uh, well, just despite what they say, I think the court will look more favorably upon Governor Corzine's proposal. I really do. I feel strongly that they will. And I, do we have any public school teachers here? Excuse me? I, I, this is not a negative, um, but the, the, the ability of the NJEA's lobby to effectively get salary increases year after year after year in every school district around the state, despite perhaps going through some difficult times, is part of the reason why we have escalated so much in our spending. They, you know, this state is, is a, a labor union state to some degree, and, um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but part of the reason is that even during recession times, contracts with uh, police, fire, and teachers are, are designed not to have a zero increase, but a, an increase. So over a period of 30 years, you're going to see educational spending in all of the districts in the state go up dramatically. And I'm not sure that's the case around the country. Uh, you know, I don't know that it's as much a given around the country as it is in New Jersey. Very difficult to change those systems. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm Paul Trachtenberg. I like Governor Byrne's line. I, He'll be back, by the way. Governor Byrne just stepped out. He'll be right back. I'd like to say something before I begin speaking. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, Ernie Riott uh, wrote a paper which indicated that had the legislature fully funded CIFA, the current school funding law, in effect for everybody but the Abbott District, it would have resulted in a billion dollars of additional aid to the Midwell districts. Uh, I think that would have largely cured the problem. We have a history in New Jersey of coming up with school funding laws and then not fully funding them. Uh, but what I want to say is uh, <laughs> a couple of random points. If you want them to be questions, I'll raise my voice at the end. <laughs> that would set a good precedent. 
Jersey is still a relatively low tax state at the state level, at least if you factor in our income, isn't it? Question one. <laughs> Question two. <laughs> isn't there a difference educationally between educating 1% of poor children in a high wealth district versus 90% of poor children in a low wealth district? If the problem regarding the education of disadvantaged children in higher wealth districts is that the local district has not attempted to that problem, where has the state education department been? It has unlimited power to control education in New Jersey. Point three, if there's a problem with some Abbott districts spending too much and getting uh, too little, where has the state education department been? Especially since two of those districts have been operated by the state itself for between 10 and 16 years. Uh, and especially since the department has repeatedly failed to carry out an evaluation of Abbott program, which the court has mandated at least three times. Uh, a, a point, I, I, if you get nothing else out of this, I hope you will go home and read and think hard and try to understand the new school funding proposal. Of course, it's complicated because there's still no bill. Uh, but I, I think it's a very skillful exercise in public relations. If you think about one of the themes that money shouldn't follow zip codes, isn't that really what Robinson and Abbott were all about? Uh, but that slogan has been co-opted now on behalf of wealthier districts that are saying, it's unfair to give all this state aid to poor districts. Uh, so I, I suggest to you to be very slow to embrace this new approach because in my view, it's a very tricky and I think potentially very dangerous slippery slope away from Abbott, away from the values everybody around here, former governors included, have fully subscribed to. Because after all, the problem is a state level fiscal crisis and education is the highest cost item isn't the only way to make sense out of what's proposed that we're going to capital reduce school spending. Uh, and it may not happen in the first year because there's a so-called old harmless, but look at how the formula runs. On the limited information we have, the second biggest line item in the education budget under this plan will be adjustment aid or hold harmless. So for one year, everybody will do fine. After one year, all the bets are off. Just to give you one example, Jersey City. Jersey City gets a bit more than $400 million of state aid now. Under the Hold Harmless Plan, it will get that plus 2%. Uh, but of that aid, $111 million is adjusted. Hold Harmless aid. So under the workings of this formula, if Hold Harmless ends, Jersey City will lose more than 25% of all its state aid. And that's true for many of the Abbott districts. So I think it's, it's a very tricky and very dangerous situation we're in. Don't be caught up by the slogans. Who could oppose you know, helping disadvantaged children wherever they live? The question is how we help them. Well, uh, you, you in, in, in that, in that very interesting and, and in-depth analysis, you didn't, you didn't touch what the real problem is. And I don't know what the real problem is. Is the real problem just money? I don't think so anymore. I told you that. Is the real problem we don't have the adequate teachers? Uh, I'm not sure. I gave you the Frank McCord example where he taught one school, he was great, he taught another school, it was terrible. Uh, is, it, is it motivation? Uh, do we need money to get people motivated? And if we do, where do we spend it? Uh, I, I, don't think we're, I don't think we're looking at a real analysis of, of what we need and how we get there. I'll just say one thing before I take this next question over here. You raised the context of the overall state financial problem. The overall state financial problem is relatively simple to explain. Uh, we, although the reasons we got into it are inexcusable, it's where we are. We are where we are. We now have a huge state debt, $33 billion. We used to be a AAA state with about $3 billion in debt. We have $100 billion of unfunded liabilities for pensions and health care. A lot of that is for teachers. 
because the state under Governor Kane took over the teacher obligations. And at the same time, in terms of the operating budget, we have operating expenditures, particularly things like Medicaid and education, which taken together grow at six to seven percent a year if you leave them alone. And we have revenues that only grow at two and a half to three percent a year if you leave them alone. Something's got to give. The line on state expenditures has to begin to bend so that eventually it crosses with a line on state revenues. In addition, we have to start making a start on paying off these other obligations, the debt and the pension and, and, and health care liabilities. So whatever, for the first time, I think, really, since the 1960s, when I was a young staff member for Governor Hughes, the overall state financial condition is a bigger issue than school funding. And school funding will be defined in terms of the overall state financial issues in the long run. Yes, Ms. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, we are having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Why don't you use the microphone? Yeah, I should have suggested people come down to the mic and identify themselves. And then raise your voice at the end so it sounds like a question. <laughs> The Woodrow Wilson School can afford to have mics. I think the, on behalf of the panel, obviously, they're not managers of, uh, of Yeah, but I mean, let me, let me just so say, I mean, one of the things that we don't do in New Jersey that we really should do to a much greater degree that used to be done at the Washington level that was not been done for the last six or seven years is oversight. That is to say, it's one thing to pass laws. It's another thing to appropriate monies to carry out the laws. But then there's supposed to be a legislative function or an administrative function of actually going and seeing how the laws are being implemented seeing how the money is being put forward. Um, New Jersey has not got a great history in terms of legislative oversight. You know, a scandal, a decapitation, or whatever hits the newspapers, then someone will hold a hearing on it. But the normal routine of having legislative oversight is not done, and I think in some respects that's what's going to have to be done to a much greater degree in terms of um, being able to make sure that the requirements are being carried out 
that there are trained um, professionals there. We're going to have to have a much higher degree of involvement um, by the legislature or the department in going and ensure, ensuring what's going on is supposed to be what's going on. I'm going to, is it Rich, is the mic working? Okay. okay. <clears throat> Could you come up to the line? In response to Governor Burns' um, question earlier, whether it was just a monetary issue, uh, I'm Noel Gordon, District Director of Guidance in Inglewood Public Schools. Uh, I do believe that the extrinsic factors are significant. However, we need to take a look at the intrinsic factors such as academic self-concept of students. What triggers my academic self-concept? What do I think about myself? Why do I feel that way? If we raise the expectation, and we've heard this time and time again, if we raise the expectation, then we might get better response from our students. I think we need to start looking at how educators execute and the, uh, the messages sometimes that we send to our students as far as expectation is concerned. So if we could use some of this money to do professional development for sensitivity to our students and how to relate to them, how to understand them from the context of their culture and also how they feel about themselves, that would uh, sort of create a tremendous impact on how we develop our students. Thank you. If I can comment, uh, I, I think we're, we're dancing around the issue of whether maybe charter schools or vouchers isn't the best way out of this situation. And if, if the key word is motivation, isn't that, isn't that uh, where we're headed? Or, or is not where we should be headed? Well, I'll, I don't, anybody want to comment on, on yes, ma'am, on charter schools specifically? Uh, well, I mean, let me just, motivation doesn't have to be in a private school, a charter school, whatever. Motivation goes to teacher training. Um, I'm a big believer, and I know this is controversial in some areas. I mean, I happen to think education courses are extremely important for educators. I mean, a lot of folks said, no, no, we just want subject matter training. And if you don't know how people learn how to learn, then you're not going to be particularly good at in, uh, giving information out. Um, so I think that's something that's important. I mean, my apprehension about uh, over-reliance upon vouchers or um, charter schools is that it brings a sort of a, a market mentality to the educational system that is not appropriate in a democratic society. I mean, I've always supported the charter schools that I've been involved with that I know something about as long as there was a commitment to say that this charter school in the city of Camden, where I know one of the charter schools, is in a sense almost a demonstration project. I don't want to come back here 10 years from now and find out that this publicly supported charter school is sort of an island of excellence in a sea of despair. If you can go learn how to do it right there and then provide to the rest of the school system the same skills, the same motivation that you have in this school, that's fine. But not to have a permanent little island, as I say, of excellence um, or for a long period of time. Yes, ma'am. Could you uh, identify yourself, too, when you get started? My name uh. <laughs> My name is Beth Heyer, and I have been for many years um, involved with public-private business education partnerships and professional development for educators. Um, and I was struck by what um, Governor Byrne and Mr. McGinnis both said. I've also, by the way, um, been privileged to serve on some of the CAPA teams for the Department of Education as a consultant. Um, and I was struck by what Governor Byrne and Mr. McGinnis both said about the qu Governor Byrne, the question is what we're spending the money on as opposed to how much. And Mr. McGinnis's comments about pedagogy and they go directly, I think, to what Governor Florio just said about pre-service education. Um, because I guess my question is, are we, and it, are we 
using pre-service education and professional development um, to prepare teachers not only for 21st century schools but for the way 21st century children learn. Um, and my observation is that perhaps there's some issues there. Um, Governor Florio, I, I've been involved for many years with discussions about charter schools and you hit the nail on the head that they were always designed to produce replicatable models. Um, they were not designed to be um, in and of themselves. So I think, and I think maybe that needs to be emphasized. Um, and I'd just like to ask one other question again with um, relationship to what we're spending the money on. Um, we hear a lot of conversation about what teachers should be doing, um, sensitivity in the community, whatever. Um, I wonder if there's any thought to spending some money on working within the communities to help students arrive at school able and ready to learn, because I think most educators will tell you that that is a key challenge that they face. Thank you. Anybody want to comment? Working in the community, how, ma'am? Um, I'm wondering whether maybe there needs to be some effort working, uh, developing partnerships between the schools and community groups. Um, and the business a, community. And the, well, business the business community, but also um, church groups and other groups that are centers for community activity because we recognize that for some disadvantaged children, maybe the support is not there in the family that it might be in some of the other districts. Yeah. Well, that, that's been the case forever. And yeah. that's what I met before about, you're spending all this money in the schools, but what about their life outside of the school? What are we doing there? What is the community doing? What is the municipal government doing? You know, what are the programs available? And my feeling has always been that we're lacking there uh, Abbott has helped us with respect to the school district, but we haven't really responded with respect to the community itself in developing these these uh, children's uh, children who are born in unfortunate circumstances, giving them opportunities that other kids have around the state. You know, I know one area of great progress over the last 15 or 20 years has been the business community's involvement in understanding. I can. I mean, when the things we did in 1990-91 went into effect, it was, some can remember, were very controversial. I mean, I can remember having heated conversations with people who I thought were more sophisticated than they ultimately were, who were saying, what are you giving money to them for? Um, it was something that was very, very ugly. Um, but what's happened is that the business community has come to realize that the workforce of the future is everywhere. And it may even be disproportionately minority, people with language problems, and therefore that community, the business community, has become involved and been much, much support, more supportive of providing education for everyone, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do from their perspective. I, I think uh, I'm going to raise a question. We uh, often talk about education as though it were in two different ways. One is we talk about what can happen with gifted and talented teachers, principals, school districts, and we have models. The other way we talk about it is in terms of what we can do that affects the system. How can we reproduce that, that model? How can we have thousands of good schools like that? I'll just start by saying two things, and this one's a commercial. The Century Foundation, together with the Russell Sage Foundation, are about to publish a book which summarizes all of the evidence about charter schools in the nation. And we now have thousands, and we have years of experience. And essentially shows that it's a 50-50 proposition. Some of them work pretty well. Some of them don't work as well as public schools. Probably the reasons are the same reasons some public schools work better than others. Gifted, talented teachers, principals. Uh, we, uh, when the court looks at this, however, the court is trying to look at some way to change the system across the board. And it uses money as a proxy for improvement for a very good reason. We use that as a proxy in other places. Goldman Sachs, to pick a firm at random in New Jersey, <laughs> gets very good people and it pays them a lot of money. I mean, really a lot of money, as we know. Now, 
Would it get those people and have that performance if it paid less than Merrill Lynch or Solomon Brothers or UBS or the rewards were less? Now, obviously, we want people in teaching and in medicine and in politics who are motivated by things other than money, but you can't blame a court in the United States of America in 2007 or over the last 30 years for saying money must be pretty damn important. It may not be the only thing. I can't issue a decision that says you shall only hire gifted and talented principals and superintendents and have only well-motivated and, and serious board members. And, you know, at one time, education in New Jersey was a very much a closed shop. That closed shop actually used to meet at the Princeton Inn, which was then a private institution, not a dorm here in Princeton. It was called the Princeton Group. And the Commissioner of Education met with the head of the NJEA, the school superintendents, the school administrators, and they made policy. The state colleges at that time all served that system. Each of the state college presidents was a principal, had been a principal, come up through the system. And they kept the peace. Uh, and they didn't spend much by contemporary standards. And people were unsatisfied with the results, and they made changes. And the results are uneven now, but there have been significant changes. I'm ask, going to ask a simple question of the Do we long for a simpler time? Were we better off 30 or 40 years ago than we are today? Or has the court and the consequences of the court decision made a positive difference? You can spend a whole lot of time lamenting the fact that the world has become much more complex. But it's probably time you've wasted um, lamenting that. The fact of the matter is we have what we have. And therefore, we have to figure out new systems for dealing with the complexities that we have. Uh, we're not going to radically change the basic governmental system. But what we have to do is to figure out how to create more opportunities for interaction to achieve the goals. But that means you have to start out telling what the goal is. For example, in education, one of our new goals ought to be to train our young people to be part of the world. I mean, we have an educational system that doesn't focus on languages, doesn't focus on geography, doesn't focus on learning about other people's cultures around the world. Think how, how interesting things might have taken a different turn. If in six or seven years ago, the American people had a basic fundamental understanding of the fact that Sunnis, Shiites, and Kurds are not likely to come together and be just partners in progress and peace that for 1,600 years they haven't done. So there's a need to change our, our educational system to take into account the new realities of world citizenship that people are going to be involved with in the future. I was at a, uh, I was at a uh, meeting in this, on this campus a couple of weeks ago of economists. And one of the economists made the point that uh, our whole educational system is based on an industrial complex that the United States has. And we're trained people for competing in the industrial complex of the 1800s. And that we, we march them into school the same way we march them into a factory. We blow a whistle, they sit down, they memorize stuff, and they blow another whistle and they leave for lunch and they come back for the afternoon. And, and, and their success is based on what they memorize. And he made the point that they can come up with a chip that can outdo any student who's on that program. And what we really have to do is teach kids how to think, and we're not doing it. Rich, I want to pick up a question based upon comments that Dick made and Professor Trachtenberg. If, in fact, the revenues are only going to go up 2% per year and we have school aid that's committed to an additional $450 million and we have rising property taxes that everybody is concerned about and we have the rest of the state budget, including municipal overburden that Governor DeFrancisco alluded to, and Medicaid problems, is it time? to relook at the whole tax structure of the state in order to keep Abbott Burke going and in order to fund the rest of the state government. We're looking at presumably a $3 billion shortfall. What would you think about 
re-looking at the entire tax re structure. Re-reworking re -working the state's tax system in what way? And spending. To where do the, what? Now, where the money comes from I, I do this with and Tom where Cain we spend every week. And, and he always says we need to cut spending and never tells me how. Uh, <laughs> tell me how to rework the state, the state tax, tax structure. Well, one, one argument could be made. We need to have a more progressive tax structure. We need to broaden the tax base. For example, just looking at the sales tax, it's quite narrow. It doesn't tax a lot of services. It doesn't tax food. It doesn't tax clothing. And those negative aspects of, the, of that base could be taken care of by tax credits and things of that nature. But if, in fact, we have this mounting problem and the commitments that Professor Trachtenberg suggested maybe not, we don't have enough money to fund Abbott as the years move on. What is the alternative? Is there another way to raise taxes in this state? Is it time to relook at it? I, ha ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if the, these panelists have all done their t put in their time on tax issues. <laughs> it's a good question. Sure. Good question. I mean, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but the whole idea is if, in fact, you're going to talk about systemic change in anything, someone has to be out front. Usually the first folks get mowed down. The first lieutenants generally get mowed down. But someone's got to go put something on the table. I never take anybody seriously who is a critic who hasn't got some specific constructive proposal to offer as an alternative. And in Jersey, the situation is such that the legislature is just constitutionally not capable of being able to launch initiatives that are comprehensive. Um, the, the judiciary is not supposed to be doing that, so it falls upon the executive. If the executive is willing to go launch things, and obviously it's not someone by themselves, they have to go build a base of support for it in the, in the private sector, the public sector. Um, but whether we talk about electric deregulation, or we talk about alternative energy systems, or school financing, or tax, those types of comprehensive things um, require real effective leadership. And the point that I would make, and I've made it on a couple of occasions today, is the times that we are in are just so dramatically and rapidly changing that for the most part, many of the institutions, many of the policies, many of the laws we have conjured up in a different day, we should not be surprised they don't work because the facts on the ground have changed dramatically. So there's a need for changes that are not just incremental, just not marginal. There's a need for systemic change, but as Governor Byrne implied, it's easier said than done. You know, I mean, I, as a longtime legislator, I mean, I watched uh, when they raised the sales tax last year, I guess they raised the sales tax, a penny. Uh, and all of you probably watched that too. Now, that's not what you're talking about because, you, you, you know, that's not as progressive as, as you mean. But look, they struggled. They struggled to raise the sales tax a penny. Made it seem like it would be political suicide voting for a 1% increase in the sales tax. My, prior to that, my line always was, in 1982, I voted to raise the sales tax a penny. No one called me to criticize me. I didn't get one letter saying, you bum, blah, blah, blah. 1992, we reduced it by one penny. No one called me to thank me. No one said a word to me. So I chuckled over this struggle to raise the sales tax one penny as if they were going to lose an election over it, which I know you never will lose an election over taxes. You lose it because of, for other reasons. And, and so to do what you suggests might be doable, takes, me, takes a lot of leadership, takes a lot of conjoling, takes a, a lot to, to, uh, to convince our legislature that this is a policy that we have to do in this time. It took years to get a 2% income tax passed. And I point to Governor Byrne, I mean, Hughes, Cahill, Governor Byrne, 2%. It took theoretically 10 years to get that passed, let alone raise it from 9% to like 12. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. And so, um, you know, my advice to legislative leaders constantly is don't put too much out there. 
Don't say you're going to change the world. Don't come out with 20 different things you're going to do this year. Pick one. Take baby steps if you have to. But, but start, get yourself on a, on a ladder of getting to where you want to be. Uh, and Governor Corzine struggled for two years with, with some of these issues. And part of it is his legislative leadership is not cooperating with him. He needs their cooperation in order to do, to enact some of the policy initiatives that, that you know, you're, you'd like to see enacted. Um, it's a new era. You know, you know it's, it's, uh, it's I hard. It's not easy. There, hard. there are three things in the budget that increase a lot faster than revenues. And it's interesting to think about them and what their political support is. One is education, where there's broad political support, because it's also property tax relief, but if all the money goes to a few places, the political support is narrowed. The other is health care, which tends to be, which is the next biggest item, which tends to go to poor people. It's Medicaid, charitable care. So the constituency for that is very narrow. The third, and actually for a number of years, the most rapidly growing uh, as a percentage, percentage terms area was corrections because we vastly increased the, percent, the number of people in prisons. Uh, that is very popular, actually, even though it's quite expensive. And uh, when you look at the budget and you look at the spending side, it's impossible to achieve any of this balance that everyone desires without doing something in all three of those areas, or at least two out of the three. And that's going to be very difficult. I think. Paul Trachtenberg raises an important question. Underneath, the, court has ma the, court ha the court's power and its decisiveness has masked the limited public support for increasing the amount of money for a relatively small number of districts. The health care issue has been masked by a couple of things, including the fact that we have the pharmaceutical industry here, and so we don't do a lot of things to save money in that area that every other state does. That's also an expression of the way politics works. Let me get a couple questions and finish up. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I mean, I said before that I kind of do. I, I guess Paul's very suspicious about this, and, and maybe, you know, maybe I should be more suspicious. Um, huh? I, <laughs> I just think it, to implement this is going to be a real, very difficult task. I mean, we haven't seen a bill. I just can't. It's going to be very hard to implement this in every district in the state. Uh, who's poor? Who's not poor? Who, you know, I, I, I don't know. I... Maybe, uh, uh, but I, ideally, I like it. The fundamental idea. I like it. Support. Yes. Governor Byrne, you know? uh, One thing I'd like to get some comment on because I, uh, I talk to a fair number of people, and, and uh, people are trying to beat the system. And I'm told that one way to beat the system is to throw kids into special education. And so if you're, if you're, in a, in a town like Milburn, where you don't get any state aid, you, you have a lot yes, of kids in special that. ed. They, they do that. They do. They do? Yes, they do. Yes. They yes. Do. have any personal friends and, and among school not, administrators? Isn't that an easier way of, uh, of adjusting the tax structure? <laughs> <laughs> Give more money for special education. Because yeah. you get the special education money regardless of the wealth of the district. Well, to some degree, Governor Corzine's proposal make some attempts to address that issue because he brought some of the special education money into the equalization component and funding special ed is separate from funds differently. So perhaps that will address that issue. You're is that going to be less special education money as such? I think that the total will be the same. The distribution perhaps will be different, as I understand. The total is up by about 400 million. The total is up by 400 million. The total, right? Yeah. For special education. Uh -huh. uh, Steve Adebato has a question. Uh oh. We'll all hold our breath. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> They're retired, yeah, though, Steve. Steve Adebato, Newark. Uh, we don't need microphones in Newark. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which were in Princeton would sound like shouting. 
They, they resolve things in whispers in doing it. So. A question. Yeah. Four entities, uh, the legislative branch, the judicial, executive, the Department of Education, what, which one would you say was the most effective in identifying and addressing these, uh, especially urban education problems? Who's supposed to be or who is? What, and maybe you might venture what was least responsible. Now let's, a report card. Well, I was only governor one year, so I can... <laughs> I can <laughs> Steve, I usually pass the buck on, on these issues, but uh, I certainly don't... I mean, who's supposed to be the Department of Education? Uh, you know, we've talked... The Department of Education should be dealing with issues like she's raised and, and the implementation of, of all these programs and the oversight of these programs, they should be doing it. You're saying, who's Are doing it best? The Department of Education was most effective in identifying and addressing That's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, I don't think so. I would think, personally, I would think the governor's office is the best at identifying the problems through their cabinet. Uh, and dealing with the issues, but I don't know that there can be any number one in this situation. This uh, is uh, for those of you who you don't know Steve Abadu. He is one of the most effective uh, educators in the state of New Jersey. He's a charter school. When I talked, when I talked to the retiring president of the Prudential Insurance Company, leaving next uh, month. He only mentioned a couple of people by name, people who he thought were great in, in terms of New Jersey and, and being helpful in New Jersey. One of them was Steve Alabama. Now, the answer to your question is if the governor wants to be the most powerful person in the state of New Jersey, he can be. Uh, he you missed a lot of tough questions. But he can be. <laughs> I'm going to take a couple more questions. There was somebody over here who waited a long time. Okay. Oh, this gentleman right here has been waiting a long time. Greg Cantrell, I'm president of the New Jersey Taxpayers Association. And one of the issues seems to be, you know, it's just let me preface this to the fact that I'm the guy who grew up in the small of St. Louis. So I understand what the realities are in urban areas, et cetera, and the challenges for bringing these kids to families. But the point being is, as I go around the state, whether I'm talking to a group of Shore Hills, and frustration about the whole spending side of this issue. This young lady pointed out, monies are flowing in there, but the results are there. As Mr. McGinn has pointed out earlier, I think the frustration is all these dollars have been earmarked, but the results aren't there. Let me tell you, from the Levy suburbs, I have a couple of kids in my district and the former school board president in my district. We are under this new proposal, and we're in a high district, one of the wealthier areas. We are going to get 20% this new aim, if this goes through. The problem I have is where, you know, the dollar should be expended. You're going to get an increase of 20%. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Increase. The, you know, just as welfare didn't solve the poverty problem in this country, I think there's a great deal of questions about these grandiose proposals, et cetera. There is no plan for the problem. We've got 616 school districts. By and large, and I was pretty active when I was on the school board, they all operate independently. We have a poor curriculum standard that every child in this state is supposed to learn the same information in fourth grade science. This isn't happening. We have four different elementary schools in my town. You might as well be moving from one town to another as far as what is actually being taught in those classrooms. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but there's no cohesive plan. I was in a business meeting yesterday. The business community is concerned about this as well, because you do have an issue of when these kids get out of school, they shouldn't have a full understanding, whether it's out of grade school or high school or college. Apparently it's not happening. The president of, uh, of uh, Verizon was there to document that. I think the real issue comes down to the fact that it seems like to me, you know, with Abbott and so many of the other proposals, etc., the focus of it to make adults happy. Some of them won't. 
<laughs> when are we going to start focusing on what the kids need? Now, those kids in, in Newark and Camden and any of the other districts, or whether it's Mendham or whatever, deserve as good of an education as mine do in my town. When is the focus going to be placed on there rather than the political expediency? We've got a dire you know, financial situation in this, in this state. We stumble from one financial crisis to another every year. We come up with a different pot of gold to solve the problem. As I've said for years, you can find the largest pot of gold in the world, you only solve it for one year. Because as soon as this influx of cash comes in, people find ways of spending it. Don't get the results as Mr. McGinnis pointed out. So when is it going to be it's not being about adults, politics, and, and dollars that aren't flowing in where they should be? Would be my question. Thank you. I don't know how to respond to the question because it's a question about life. <laughs> to say there's no simple answer. I mean, this is what we have government for, to try to work through some of these difficulties. And yeah, the old, the old saw about whether you, uh, you, know, you don't like the expense of education, find out the expense of ignorance. Um, so again, you also talked a little bit about administration. There's lots of areas that we could do something about, but there doesn't seem to be a political will uh, to do that sort of thing. I can recall, and I don't know if the numbers are still the same, but when I was in office, I used to quote the fact that New Jersey spent 40% higher than the national average for education for our administration of education. Um, but whenever anyone tries to say we ought to coordinate, rationalize school districts so as to be able to eliminate the cost of the redundancy and the duplication, to have, as what you seem to be implying, a uniform outcome across the nation, across the state, that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of political support as well. But look at this real reality of the situation. Uh, Governor De Francisco talked about the sales tax issue. Last year, there was a major battle of what the trend about raising the, the uh, sales tax of 10, 16%. But, okay, it got through. Half of the penny was going to go to the property tax review. That was the final agreement. Everybody went back and they were happy. It just turned down proposal to dedicate the other asset to property tax relief. From the average taxpayer's perspective, did we need the one cent increase to begin with? It didn't go to pay down yet. It didn't go for the original justification for it. It went again to make some people politically happy. With the school construction, $8.6 billion. But we know what you're against. What are you for, by the way? What are we for? for Back. Where are we going to be in five years, in ten years? We're still going to be having the same conversation because it isn't focusing on the problem. We're focusing on, on the symptoms. You know, the state has a cancer. Uh, We're treating the, the, uh, the uh, nausea. Okay. We're going to move on to another question. Yes, sir. You're, you're right, though. And, uh, and uh, the, the fact is that uh, we're not interested. You, Hubert Humphrey used to have a great two-hour speech on the Constitution of the United States. Two-hour speech. I heard, I heard it one. And one of the points he made was that nowhere in the Constitution of the United States will you find the word efficient. <laughs> yes, can, can I just, I mean, I'm just not prepared to concede that efficiency um, is the beginning and the end. What efficiency, even monitoring efficiency. If we're talking, and Dick earlier talked about Goldman Sachs folks and whether they were worth the money we paid for. Well, you can very well objectively determine whether they're worth it or not. And the profit and loss outcome. Can you do the same thing in government? Because some of the outcomes are not as neat as whether you made money that year or so. Should we be striving for cost-effective programs? The answer is, of course. But it's not as easy to determine as a profit and loss statement is at a uh, corporation level. But there's a lot of disputes. I suspect if we went around person to person in this room, outcomes that we want to achieve in education would probably be as numerous as there are people in this room. So uh, the whole idea that somehow we're going to discover what the magic formula is that will get us to nirvana tomorrow um, is just something that's very unrealistic and in some respects immature. 
The process of governing is the process of constantly striving to be able to get the best arrangement at the time for the majority of people in the society. And again, that's just something that's not neat. And Churchill said, democracy is the worst system except for all the rest. And so what we do is, as long as we're continuing to progressively strive to a higher level of attainment, that should be what we try to do, rather than somehow lamenting the fact that we haven't reached the ultimate point of perfection. Excuse me, this man's, this, this man's waiting. Oh, I think I can repeat it. I, actually, I can probably answer it quickly and save you the trouble. <laughs> All of these people had before them the example of Governor Richard J. Hughes and his <coughs> Commissioner of Education, Marburger, who raised the question of, of crossing district lines in order to integrate the schools and is generally given credit for turning a two-to-one Democratic legislature into a three-to-one Republican legislature. So the, there wasn't a kind of experiment with throwing that idea out in, in New Jersey politics, and it had a decisive consequence. I don't think it became an issue that rose to the level of a test of courage because it would, became irrelevant after that as a, as a prospect. We all know, I started this conversation talking about the Coleman Report, and we all know that integrating schools by, not necessarily by race, but by economic uh, class would do some good for the people whose economics are not so good. There are some places in the country where that actually is done, including parts near St. Louis and North Carolina. Uh, but uh, the rest of the country, it's proven extremely difficult, and it is now being fought out in higher education as a, as a substitute for uh, uh, racial integration because the courts, this, the United States Supreme Court does not look with favor on using race in any way as a judgment of who can go to what school or who can be admitted to what school. And we will probably find out over the next decade in a series of Supreme Court decisions how they feel about economic criteria being used uh, to admit people into colleges and programs. In other words, admitting some people because their incomes are low who might otherwise not be. Uh, admitted. And uh, so it'll play out at both levels. But I think it's, there's a world of what's relevant to politics and a world of what's irrelevant to politics. And it became irrelevant in New Jersey in the 1960s and 70s for reasons that were nakedly political. Uh, it's, it's democracy, though. It, it, you know, the people ultimately this system may not be very responsive. It may often not do what people want it to do. But there are, limi there are uh, limits to that because people will punish those politicians who do what they don't want them to do and throw them from office. And that tends to define what's possible. Uh, what you are seeing a little bit is a, a, a city like Hoboken, for instance, which had the problem 20 years ago and doesn't have the problem now not because we did anything in, in uh, Trenton, but because they did something in Hoboken. And now Hoboken is a, a very integrated uh, community. Montclair is now a very integrated uh, community. And so I, I think you're seeing that from the back end forward, slowly. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take one more question and then ask Rich Kivi to sum it up. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted to address some of the comments. Could, could you come down and use the microphone?
Hello, my name is Lindy Wilson. Um, regarding the special ed funding, I think it's interesting, and I'm not sure how it's going to work in the new formula, but the only funding we had following the child was special ed funding, and now we're changing that not to follow the child. And the other thing is that if there's spending and oversight issues that we have problems with, I'm concerned that developing policy to address that is like punishing the class. Instead of dealing with the oversight issues, finding out why districts are doing what they're doing and correcting specific districts, now we're developing a policy for the whole state trying to control something that we may not even understand. And I think that I'd be more comfortable with the formula if I felt that the state had done more due diligence at looking why districts are behaving the way they are and finding out what the problem is. If CUSAC actually said, it, is there soap in the faculty bathroom? Are there books in every child's hands? Instead of looking at more general issues. And, and I wondered if you had any comments about that. Repeat the question. I, I, th I think the way to put the question is, 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 is this uh, change in the formula reflective of what we know about what's actually happening in the schools and how well they're performing against the criteria that already exist? Or is it a mechanical change that simply affects where, how the money follows people, uh, children with students with particular characteristics? About special education? Well, special education is be everything, really, the whole thing. Well, as I understand it, I don't purport to be sort of expert in this new program. The special education formula is going to be changed from dealing with every student. It's, it's almost the converse of what's happening across the board, saying that special education students, when in large concentrations, um, are more difficult, more expensive to try to treat, and therefore there'll be weighted formulas for providing money for special education students who are in larger concentrations. I think that uh, maybe we should defer to Gordon um, because that means that there's a change from an equal amount of money special educationally for every student to perhaps providing more special education money for those special education students that are in concentrations, presumably urban areas. Well, I believe it's the average for the state, and then it's going to be multiplied by your enrollment. So it's not going to look at the number of children. To, to address your point that some districts may be loading that special ed, but I think it would have been better to look at why those districts are loading up on special ed. They get money. Ed. They get money. They need, well, because they need it. But they're just going to, you know, what, like why are you going to address special ed and push the funding to address what's a different underlying need of these districts. I don't, I don't, think, think, any of, I don't think any of us can answer that question. We literally only know what we've read in the paper about the program, and, and, and uh, I'm sure it'll be part of the process. Yeah, Gordon McGinnis probably can address the question. Uh, a lot of issues Speak up a little bit. <laughs> a lot of issues are raised around served my five-year sentence recently, uh, and, and I would offer an observation that I think is pretty crucial to this discussion. The Department of Education is established to regulate. The assumption that it recognizes good or bad education is an assumption that one should not make. It, is, it, does, it does recognize compliance with regulations. It can count. It can receive reports, it can require reports, it can do things that uh, are common to bureaucracies, and that is in direct conflict with the habits of mind that you need to offer high quality instruction to kids in poor school districts. And so it does not really have, has not had the mission to be a partner in the better education of kids it's had the mission to write regulations and to enforce them. And that's why the State Board of Education exists, and that's what it does. It takes about a year to take a proposal for regulations to adopt them. And they put it through so that all the groups have an opportunity to comment on it, and that becomes the law. And the practice of education requires not a formula or a mechanical approach, it requires a different approach if it's going to be effective. 
And that is not an approach which is within the culture of the Department of Education. So I think we ought to stop looking for a mechanical answer that can be easily adopted that will be enforced by bureaucrats in Trenton and driven home in Camden or Newark or wherever. But, but if I could just um, amplify off of what uh, Gordon said, the theory is, and the theory actually is, works where it's supposed to work, is that, for example, the Department of Education comes before the appropriations committees for monies every year. At that point, it is a legitimate you know, set of responsibilities of the legislators to say, well, we're giving you this money. You have regulations. Are the regulations carrying out the clear intent of what we want? And if, in fact, they're not, people are supposed to be called on the carpet. That doesn't work very well at the state level. That's just a commentary on what we should be doing. And again, I happen to believe that it's executive driven. The executive should drive the legislature to go and make sure that they do what they're supposed to be doing, which is the oversight responsibilities. So it can't be just saying, well, it doesn't work, or we haven't got a plan, or whatever. The, all the pieces are in place for making this, and Civics 101, for making the process work well, we just have to have more concentrated focus on having accountability, cost-effective allocation of money, and appropriate declarations of what the goals are that we're trying to achieve. The system can work, it just needs more of a hands-on jumping into the process, beating up some people that have to be beat up from time to time. Okay, well, on that note. <laughs> That's good. We need an optimistic well, note. Well, we started out with Abbott Burke, and we wandered into tax policy and municipal overburden and integration and formulas and family content and family values. And so uh, I would like to thank uh, Dick Leone for uh, being the moderator for this panel, and Governor Byrne and Governor Florio and Governor DeFrancesco, and for you for coming. We like to do these kind of forums but they're not possible without the uh, uh, interest of the panelists who participate. And I know they have all very busy schedules, so we certainly appreciate it. And maybe we could give, uh, give them a round of applause.